In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the head of every woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Does this mean then that the woman is sourced from the husband? Well, this is a good question. Or in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, when it says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, does this mean that God's the gospel is like dynamite? Uh, because he uses the word dunamis. What I'm going to argue in this video is that you really need to understand more than just the meaning of the word to understand the meaning of the word. Let's get into it. Have you ever looked up a Greek word in a lexicon and seen that there's a whole bunch of different meanings for a word and then gone ahead and just picked the one that you think looks the best for the context that you're looking at? Well, I've seen people do this a whole lot and it ends up meaning that you get this crazy ex explanation for a particular passage. For instance, I mentioned before the head, the man is the head of a woman like in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 and the argument goes that the word head here can refer to the head of a river and the head of the river is the source from which the river flows, which the water flows and therefore the head of the woman is a reference to the source from which the woman comes. In other words, we're talking about here the creation account. Does this hold up? And how can you be sure that you don't fall into this trap? Well, first, let's just acknowledge that, th to be sure, the word head can refer to a source. The question we have to ask, though, is this actually what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3? Is there something here in this context that argues against this position? That, that it's not actually thinking about the husband as the source of the wife, for instance. Well, let's look at the first part of Paul's argument there in verse 3. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Is Paul arguing then that man has his source in Christ? Well, certainly we can argue that we're made in the image of God, but it doesn't say anywhere that we're made in the image of Christ. In fact, if it says anything about being in the image of Christ, it's about being transformed into the image of Christ, indicating that we don't currently have the image of Christ, which is the character, which is really what, you know, being transformed and, you know, imaging Christ and being transformed in the New Testament is really all about. Or even in the second part, the last part of this argument here, are we trying to say here that Paul is saying that Christ came from God? Well, at best, that is a stretch, right? Whatever your view of eternal sonship, this doesn't fit the context here. Paul is simply not making an argument about where man comes from or where Christ comes from, but about the relationship between the husband and the wife and between, the, between God, uh, Christ and, his, and the man, right? That's really where this goes through the rest of it. So source, I'd argue... That source is not a good argument, or not at least not a good understanding of the word here. But again, if you were to go look at a lexicon, you might see source as perhaps one of the definitions, and you could be tempted just to pick that in order to say, well, this fits my argument better. But you have to look more broadly at what a word means before you actually, you know, come to a conclusion. And the key argument that I really want to make in this video is that you need to look at the context of the, of the text that you're looking at and more broadly at how a word is being used. Otherwise, you end up falling into exegetical fallacies. And D.A. Carson in his excellent books, Exegetical Fallacies, covers 16 different word study fallacies uh, which you can fall into. And I've actually talked about this a little bit in the past. I'll leave a link to that video just here so you can look that up for yourself and find out more about, you know, doing word studies and just how difficult they really are. So when it comes to doing word studies, whatever you do, don't just pick the meaning that seems to fit your theology or your presuppositions. Instead, choose, consider the argument of the, of the author, particularly in the context, and consider the meaning of the word, just not only in the context, but more broadly. Let me give you another example. But before I do that, if you're getting value from this, hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe as well, because then you get more videos just like this. Another example is in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, or as the NIV says, test and approve what is the will of God. This particular argument is made more difficult when you look in BDAG, which is uh, probably, probably the premier lexicon available for the Greek, ancient Greek language. So if you look in BDAG, the first meaning you'll see there is to make a critical examination of something to determine its genuineness. 
But there's a second definition in BDAG as well, and that is to draw a conclusion about the worth of something on the basis of testing. And BDAG tends to see the use of this word in the New Testament, dokimazo, as for relating to that first meaning, which is to make a critical examination of something. But if you look at the usage of this word, I don't think that stacks up. I think, in fact, the most important usage of this word is really the one about proving the value or the character of something through testing. And it's not so much that it focuses on the testing itself, but on the proven nature of it. For instance, if you go to 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, which is where you see perasmos, which is another Greek word. We often translate this as tempting, but this is really the idea of test something. Then dokimazo probably doesn't have that exact same meaning it actually probably has a different meaning, which I would argue is actually the result of the testing. So you do perazo to test something and dokimazo to show the worth of something. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, test yourself to see if you are in the face. And that test yourself is perazo, right? To, to test, to, uh, in fact, it's um, uh, hiatos perazite, right? So it's that perazo, you're going to test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. And that word examine yourselves here, this is the word dokimazo. So now it's using this phrase, iatos dokimazete, right? So prove yourself is probably a better way of looking at it. So it's not just saying, you know, test yourself and then test yourself again. It's actually saying test yourself and examine the outcome of the test or demonstrated, you know, from the testing, you want to see the demonstrated result of that. And look at what it says in the second or the last part of the verse, unless indeed you fail the test. And you can see there in that last part where it's got, if no, you know, if you are not you know, dokimazo, again, it's got this same word root, adokimoi, in this case, it's the noun form of this, but it's got that alpha privative on the end to negate it, unproven, right? If indeed you are not unproven is really the idea, not untested, but unproven. So the word adokimoi in this context comes from the same root and shares the same lexical meaning, and by lexical meaning, I just mean the, the meaning of the word, as the word dokimazo. So you've got that same root idea here in uh, dokimoi, except it's negated, and dokimazo, which is the positive proving, essentially, of this as well. So the point of this verse is to focus on the outcome of the test, not on the testing itself, right? So in other words, test yourselves, that's the, that's the job of doing the test, but you want to prove yourselves and you don't want to fail to prove yourselves, essentially is the idea here. And this fits with Paul's theology more broadly, where he talks about, for instance, in 2 Corinthians, same book, 5 verse 9, we have as our ambition, whether at home or away, to be pleasing to him. The outcome really is what Paul is focused on here. So when we look in this passage, and we look at passages like Romans 1 verse 28, where it talks about, you know, being unproven, it says, and just as they did not proved to have the knowledge of God uh, in, their, in their mind, God handed them to an unproven or worthless or failing, failing the test mind. In other words, they've got a worthless mind. And so that's that idea again of adokimoi, this idea of failing. So here's the point of all of this. If you're dependent on just word studies for understanding Greek, then you are really going to be you're not really studying the Bible, you're just looking at individual words. And individual words are not where the bulk of the meaning is. It's in actually following how the word is being used in the context, like we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or how the word is used more generally, like we see with uh, Dokimazo in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. So we've got to be really careful when you come to looking at words. Don't depend on word studies. Instead, look at the context, look more broadly, and that's where the riches really are, not in word studies. If all you know is word studies, you're really going to be shortchanging the congregation. The word dunamis, for instance, the, power, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, does not mean that the, the gospel is dynamite. In fact, they, there was no such thing as dynamite in Paul's day, and so therefore we're reading into that word a future idea that Paul never had any concept of whatsoever. So... Be careful. When you're doing word studies, make sure you're looking at the context, make sure you're following the author's argument, and make sure you know how a word has been used in other contexts, particularly by the author, particularly beyond that author in other readings and other texts as well. And this is why I really recommend that you actually read the New Testament in Greek. Don't just do exegesis, like picking your way through the text. Actually read the text, understand the authors, understand the worldview and the language, 
as best you can according to what you see in the text. Because when you do that, that's when you're going to understand the flow of the author's argument far better than you do even looking at a translation as well. If you do want to learn to read the Bible in the original languages, then download the free Biblical Languages Starter Pack from biblicalmastery.academy or bma.to. Get the free copy of that so you can get underway learning Greek and reading through passages really within six months, okay? Before I go though, let me ask you one question, and that is have you seen these kinds of fallacies being done before? If so, let me know in the comments and tell me where you've seen them and what the effect has been as well. I'd love to hear from you there. Thanks so much for watching. Keep taking small consistent steps toward mastery and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. We'll see you then.